many Bible stories uh, become a bit of a caricature in the Christian's mind. Uh, the most obvious ones being Noah's Ark. You know, we all have some kind of image of a bunch of animals piling out the top of a large, you know, a smaller boat, and then maybe Jonah in the in the belly of the whale by a campfire, and uh, <laughs> the the parting of the Red Sea. You know, these are these are images that we get our um, our imagination has to work to come up with what this looked like. And we rely on cartoonish imagery, we rely on coloring books to kind of animate our thinking as to how, what these events look like. And that makes some sense because these events, um, they're not normative, so we don't really have a reference. And the, the Christmas season has a lot of those stories. There's a lot of uh, tradition and these pictures we have in our mind of what took place at the birth of Christ. And maybe what maybe one of the most significant or prominent ones of those is the three wise men. You have likely had to buy a Christmas card and you've stood there trying to select the perfect card for this person, which by the way is always anxiety for me. Do you guys stand at a card wall for like 20 minutes just stressed, don't know how to make decisions? Uh, well, one of the most prominent ones that uh, will likely have stood out for you is one of the three wise men, right? Three guys on three camels wearing fabulous attire, and they're carrying three little trinkets or little gifts for Jesus, right? That's the picture we all have. So we're going to spend some time looking at that biblical account this morning and try and separate uh, Scripture and tradition. So turn with me to Matthew Chapter 2, Matthew chapter 2, sorry, I'm having to find it as well, usually I have it marked out, and we're going to read the first 12 verses. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, Wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, And Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of jo Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them that the ti what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, Bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Okay, so just even reading through that, you will notice a lot of the imagery or the, what you might see on a greeting card didn't, wasn't even in this depiction. Now, I think the, most of the assumptions regarding these guys uh, and how they fit into the biblical account, I, I do think it is incorrect. And I think you miss out on some really significant and rich uh, parts of this story, which we're going to spend some time with this morning. Now, this 
only shows up in the book of Matthew. It's not in any of the other Gospels. And uh, that does not mean that it's not as significant. And as you will see with what we're going to go through this morning, there's just some really great, profound insight uh, that we can take from this relationship between the three wise men and Jesus. So first thing we're talking about is who are, who were the three wise men? Who were these guys? The first misconception is that there were three wise men. <laughs> You'll notice in our text this morning that it just says wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. The idea that there were three uh, is probably just correlated to the fact that there were three gifts. And so just uh, maybe how the story gets told is, well, there's three gifts, there's probably three wise men. So that's the first thing that is likely inaccurate in our imaginations. The second misconception is that that they were just merely wise men. Uh, It's an understatement uh, to reduce their identity to some guys that were wise or had wisdom. That would be uh, selling these guys short with who they are. Now, you may have heard them be described as being the three kings, right? Well, that's not correct either. They weren't kings. So, yeah, they, they were, I'm sure they were wise people. So they were technically wise men. They weren't kings. There weren't three of them. So that you're the classic uh, Christmas carol, We Three Kings from Orientar, that, that loses its theological credibility pretty quickly. And I'm not against that song. I'm just, (laughs) lyrically, it's not precise enough. So who were they? So who were these guys then? If they're not, um, maybe that picture that we have in our mind. Well, your translation may say, and I think probably the best translation, uh, translation, is they are called the Magi. I'm not sure if that's what it said. It does not say that in my uh, translation. Calling them the Magi best captures the original language. So Magi, uh, they are a tribe uh, from the Persian, uh, the Medo-Persian Empire. Uh, specifically, they were a priesthood. Uh, they're an unusual tribe, and they had some really unusual beliefs. And it's very fascinating that of all people to come search out for Jesus, that it would be the Magi. They weren't Jews. They were from a foreign land. And for all intents and purposes, they didn't worship Yahweh. They had another religious belief system, which immediately makes this interesting. What they believed, they they were like a compilation of um, paganism, uh, astrology, astronomy. Uh, They were really into science. Uh, In fact, that's where we get the word magic for the magi, so the same derivative there. So they kind of got into some of those uh, behaviors as well. Uh, They were the elitists of society. These men were the polymaths of the day. They, They represented actually the highest level of education. They were the benchmark for intellect and brilliance. So they were an interesting hybrid of science, faith, mysticism. They were technically monotheistic. They did believe in a God, but not, again, not Yahweh, not the God of the Jews. Uh, Their interest in astronomy uh, led them to believing in astrology, which was common back then. And they were also famous for interpreting dreams and, and reading the stars. So that's who the Magi were. These men that came to see Jesus, who you're seeing on the front of your Christmas card, that's who these people are. This is what they believe. Now, so I've just said that these guys are not your typical example of believers. So how did they hear about Jesus? Like, why are they on the search for Jesus then? How did they hear about the truth? Well, in God's providence, they were heavily influenced by the prophet Daniel. That's interesting. Hundreds of years earlier, the prophet Daniel influenced the Magi, which would lead to this moment where they would arrive to see the birth of Christ. 
You might remember the incident that happened that led to Daniel's promotion when he was in the Babylonian Empire. In Daniel 2, verse 24, it says, Therefore Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He said, he went and said to them, said thus to them, do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king and I will show the king the interpretation. Okay, so just to back up here a moment, uh, the king had had a dream, Nebuchadnezzar had had a dream and he went to his magi and he said to them, what does this mean? And the magi couldn't interpret it. And that was going to lead to the king saying, well, then I'm done with you. You're not useful. You're fraudulent. You're mean it's meaningless if you can't interpret my dreams. I'm going to have you all killed. And so Daniel in the 11th hour uh, saves the day. In uh, verse 25, it says, I have found among the exiles from Judah a man, this is Daniel, who will make known to the king the interpretation. So this is a big moment. A lot of people are going to die if Daniel can't get the interpretation from the Lord. And let me read that interpretation in verse 46. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and paid homage to Daniel and commanded that an offering and incense be offered up to him. The king answered and said to Daniel, truly your God is God of gods and Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this mystery. Then the king gave Daniel high honors and many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. Okay, the wise men, this is the magi, that's the, the word. So this is how the words of Daniel are going to find root and be in, instilled in the hearts of the magi that hundreds of years later they would know to come looking for the the king of kings. Now, these guys, the, the Magi, they're very powerful men. Uh, they were said to be more powerful than kings. This is fascinating to find out that the Magi, well, these are the ones that appointed and deposed kings. These are the ones that sanctioned and signed off and said, yes, you can be a king and you are no longer going to be a king. You'll be relieved of your duties. That's how powerful, how powerful the Magi were. They held kings accountable for their actions and for their decisions. They were tremendously powerful, and they were tremendously wealthy as well. So they had a lot of political power. So considering their wealth and their power, you can safely assume that there weren't just three of them meandering their way from the east to try and find a baby in a manger. There were likely hundreds of people in this caravan. This entourage would have had a tremendous amount of servants. That they would have had security. They would have had a whole lot of people with supplies coming with them. This was not just three random noblemen doing a little business trip out to Bethlehem. This would have been a, a tremendous caravan of people, powerful people. And they wouldn't have been on camels. <laughs> they would have been on Persian steeds. So I know this is a little bit of a disappointment to find out there weren't three of them. They weren't kings. They didn't have camels. And they weren't carrying these little treasure chests, those little trinkets that I think we all have that imagery in our mind. Because I think to imagine like that is to reduce this whole story to a level of a little bit more insignificance. Now, the king in the, the original language is capitalized. So it says when they're looking for a, a king, uh, it says, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? In the original language, that's in, in a capital uh, case. They're not looking for a king. They are looking for the king. They are looking for the one that Daniel spoke of. They had come to confirm, affirm, and bow down to the one true king. That's a big deal. One article I read, and I couldn't verify this, so I hesitated sharing this with you, but one article said that 
at the time of the Magi's pilgrimage to find Jesus, that the Medo-Persian Empire was actually without a king. Their king had just been deposed previously. King Phraates had just been relieved of his duties, or he had died. It wasn't clear in the article. And if that's true, that's just fascinating that they're in search for a king. The Magi are kingmakers. That's what they do. These are the people that say, you're king, and we can confirm and appoint you into kingship. These were three random guys on camels, right? These are kingmakers. These are the most intellectual people of the day. These are the people that have been waiting since Daniel told them. Now, because remember, Daniel's the chief prefect over them at the time, and he would have absolutely told them not only about the things to come and, and, and the, the prophecies, Daniel's 70 weeks, remember that? We don't have time to unpack that right now, but they would have known that. That would have been in their mind, which means they had a small window of time. They knew that the, the king of kings was going to be coming. So I think it is significant that the one group of people that are kingmakers are coming looking for the king. Now, so that's a little insight about the Magi. So that should open up your excitement about who these guys are. Now, the other character in the story is King Herod. It's worth talking about him a little bit. King Herod, the king of the Jews. So consider, consider um, the Magi's question. They get there, and they say, where is he who is born king of the Jews? They are asking the guy that is the king of the Jews, hey, so where's the, where's the real king of the Jews? That's offensive, isn't it? No, they weren't confused about who Herod was. Herod, Herod is not even a Jew. And he had been appointed by the Romans to be the king of the Jews. And so he reigned and sat on the throne and sitting there in Jerusalem as king. The Magi come. You think he doesn't know who the Magi are? Oh, he knows who they are. The kings fear the Magi because they can make decisions about him. They have tremendous power. So they come to him and they say, hey, where's the king of the Jews? It would have been reasonable for him to say, oh, uh, actually right here, I don't know if you've seen, you know, my scepter or the crown. This is, these aren't props. These, I'm, I'm the king. But he knew, uh, and the Magi most certainly knew that Herod was not the long-awaited king. He was not the one that Daniel spoke of. Herod was not the rightful king. He wasn't in the line of David. He was not a descendant of Jacob. Like I mentioned, he wasn't a Jew. He was actually a descendant of Esau, not Jacob. So in verse 2, it says, For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Well, of course, uh, like I said, of course he was troubled. This is disheartening. Herod feared the, the Magi. Now, just a few comments about Herod. He is um, he's an interesting fellow. He's a very disturbed individual. The Magi's inquiry directly threatens his authority and kingship. Now, just to give you a sense of how disturbed this guy is, uh, he often killed a large number of people. He would often have people executed or assassinated. Anyone that threatened his kingship, he had them killed. He had, he had his sons killed because he thought they were gunning for his position. He had a few of his wives killed. I think he had 10 wives, not wise. You do have 10 wives, not wise to kill them off either. So this guy is an absolute psychopath. This guy's a maniac. He's killing off wives. He's killing off his sons. He's killing off anybody that threatens his kingship. Now, why were, why were Jerusalem? I mean, that speaks to why Jerusalem, because it says that, and Jerusalem were troubled with him. Well, I think Jerusalem knew exactly 
what it meant. It meant that any time that someone threatened his throne or his kingship, he went on a killing spree. Oh, I could imagine when the Magi rolled into town, came in, looked at King Herod and said, uh, where's the king of the Jews? I think everybody in Jerusalem braced himself for impact. Oh, no. This guy, this maniac, he's killed his sons and his wives. Now what? And that's exactly what happened in Matthew 2, verse 16. A few verses later, it says, Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious, and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. That, that's a big deal. That guy's a, it, it truly is a psychopath. This is sometimes, uh, sometimes called the massacre of the innocents. Sometimes this is referenced to. Now, we shouldn't be surprised that he went out and he just slaughtered all the kids. He killed his own children. You think he has any qualms killing someone else's kids? Not at all. So this should give you a real sense of who Herod is. In fact, the Roman Emperor Augustus reportedly said this of Herod, you're better off to be one of his pigs than to be one of his sons. Now, Jesus is a king by way of royal lineage. He's of the line of David, which is, this is essential to the Jews. This is meaningful. But he's also the king of the Gentiles as shown here with the Magi, who are Gentiles. So both Jew and Gentile recognize that Jesus is king. Now, so we keep moving through the story here. Both Herod and the Magi are now in a desperate search for Jesus for, for two different reasons, two different goals. For Herod, he needs to eliminate the threat. He's going to kill Jesus. The Magi, they want to bow down and worship him. So there's been an APP put out on Jesus, be on the lookout for baby Jesus and Bethlehem. Now, a king, if King Herod knew uh, his Old Testament, which he wouldn't, and why would he? He's not a Jew. But if he did, he would actually have a, he would know where Jesus was, that he would be in Bethlehem, the birthplace of the Messiah. The third part of the story is Bethlehem is the birthplace of the Messiah. So in verse, uh, in our text this morning, verse 4, it says, And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Jesus was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will be a shepherd, to my people Israel. So Herod, um, not knowing where he could find Jesus, uh, gathers together the, you know, the who's who of the Jewish community, you know, the Pharisee and the scribes, and he asks them, so where, where can I find them? Where can I find this Jesus character? And they answer him correctly citing Micah chapter 5. Fantastic prophecy scripture here. Micah chapter 5 verse 2. Note this down because it is one of the most prominent prophecy scriptures, it says, but you, O Bethlehem, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be the ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. So the, the Magi are likely aware of this verse. Uh, chances are Daniel told them this verse. Daniel sharing the prophecy about the, the king that will one day come. They, and he likely told them, according to Micah, he's going to come out of Bethlehem. And now I, I would, I'd say that the, the Magi, uh, who maybe are without a king, uh, they're, they're aware of Scripture to some extent here, and they've seen some kind of a star. So why didn't they go to Bethlehem? They went to Jerusalem. I think maybe, I don't know this for sure, I think my thought is they are following whatever the star is, and they're 
heading that direction, I think on the last leg of their trip, it made sense. Go to Jerusalem. Because who are they looking for? They're looking for a king. Where is the king going to be? In the capital. It's going to be at Jerusalem. It's where the temple is. It's where the throne will be, the throne of David. So it is completely reasonable that they went to uh, Jerusalem. And that's why they crossed paths with Herod. Let's talk about that star for a second. What was the star of Bethlehem? Have you guys wondered that? And has your imagination come up with something for that one as well? Well, this next little section here will confuse you a little bit. So that's something to look forward to right now. Verse 2, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and we've come to worship him. Well, there have been many explanations that have been proposed as to uh, what this star is. There's lots of uh, theories and perspectives about this phenomenon. Uh, maybe you've heard this one, Johannes Kepler. You may have heard of Kepler, the 17th century mathematician, astronomer. He proposed that this was a cosmic event. Uh, called the conjunction of planets. So he thought that what the Magi had seen was an alignment of Saturn and Jupiter. Uh, You may have even heard Jupiter be referred to as the king planet. So according to Kepler, on 7 BC, these two planets aligned, and that would have produced a really bright, dramatic, illuminating light. So I know that's what he believes the star of Bethlehem was. And that's an interesting thought because it kind of reconciles with astronomy and science. That could be it. Uh, Especially because in first century astronomy, they didn't discern between planets and stars. Uh, From their vista, they just look up and they just, it all looks the same. In fact, they called planets wandering stars back then. So that's one thought. Another theory is that the star was only experienced in the minds of the Magi. Maybe. I don't think this is a a very useful explanation, or I feel like it's an unnecessary explanation. I don't think there's a need to reduce this event to some kind of personal manifestation. So of course that's possible, but I don't know why that would be the case. So I'm not... I don't think too much of that thought. A popular view among theologians is that it was not a star. Rather, it was the Shekinah glory of God. In Luke 2, verse 9, we read about the shepherd's encounter with the angels, and it says, the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. So it's thought that maybe it's that same glory that the shepherds saw In Matthew 24, it describes the second coming of Christ, and it says, they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And so the thought is that 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 Shekinah glory that we see throughout the Old Testament, what we see, what the shepherds saw, maybe what we'll see at his return, that blazing glory of God, was that the star? Uh, Maybe. I mean, that's a a pretty good thought. Respectable theologians Hold to that view. Now, the details at the end of the day aren't overly uh, important. Uh, The journey is second to the destination for this story. So I don't know if I've just, again, just confused you a little bit about the star. Uh, I think it's totally fine to think that it is a literal star. It's fine to think that it could be the Shekinah glory of God. It's, It's fine to imagine that God manifested a star that guided the Magi to Bethlehem. And very, however that happened, it doesn't really matter. But again, it just plays to some of the tradition and the true scripture or what is actually scriptural. So that's just food for thought. And then the fifth part of this is they do arrive. They do find Jesus. Behold, the Son of God. In verse 11, it says, And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, 
gold and frankincense and myrrh. And of course, being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Okay, so the other misconception here is that they visited Jesus in a manger. So that's likely not the case. Mary and Joseph likely didn't spend more than a day or two in the manger. I'm sure they relocated to better accommodations. And then you'll notice there in verse 11, and going into the house. In fact, it's possible that Jesus was much older. He could have been weeks, months, even years. We don't know. The the fact that um, Herod is killing children under two, because if if this had happened when the, the two days after Jesus was born, why would Herod kill all the babies that are under two? He would narrow his criteria for babies to slaughter. So that's another misconception. They did not visit the manger. And uh, Mary and Joseph, they actually didn't relocate to Nazareth till after Herod had died. So they were in Bethlehem. They weren't in the manger anymore. And this is where the Magi will eventually find them. Now, I remind you of the Magi's duty to appoint kings. The fact that they fell down and worshipped him is significant. There in verse 11. The Magi's affirming of Jesus' kingship is no small thing. And it is at this moment that they give gifts to Jesus. Verse 11, then opening their treasures, they opened him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Let's talk about those for a a few moments there. So again, there are many theories about the significance and and, and the meaning of these gifts and why these specific gifts. They feel a little bit random and not super practical possibly, like maybe a donkey uh, car seat system would have been better or, or diapers or something, right? There might have been something a little bit more practical, What is the significance of gold, myrrh, and frankincense? Well, unfortunately, the Bible doesn't expressly tell us the significance of this. Uh, However, history and tradition, they do give us some insight into the the practical and uh, symbolic meaning of these specific gifts. So with gold, obviously it's a precious Medal, and it, it was used to signify kingship and royalty. That's no surprise. Uh, gold was reserved for the wealthy, for kings, for dignitaries, etc. Uh, I will say there was likely not a small amount of gold. Think about it. The Magi, think about their trip. Think about how much of an event this is for them. Think about how wealthy and powerful they are. Think about the fact that they're coming with a gift for the king of kings. It was possibly a lot more gold than we would like to imagine. Now, these are just some of my comments. This is not theologically anything. might be true. I don't know. But in those days, it was customary to bring to even just like a low-profile king who Jesus is not, and they know that Jesus isn't. But just even for a low-profile king, it was customary to bring about 120 pounds of gold. That's a lot of money now. Back then, one scholar estimated that that's worth about $5 million. Now, I'm not saying that Joseph, Mary, and Jesus received a family fortune and hit the jackpot and or multi multi This is not a prosperity teaching. That's not where this is going. But I want us to get into that scene and realize that they've just finally, after hundreds and hundreds of years of of what Daniel had talked to them about, have finally arrived. They followed a star. They looked at Scripture, and and they get there. And and there's hundreds of them. It's probably, they probably, these gifts, they're probably generous. It was not a minute amount, and I know we'd all like to think that Jesus was poor, and maybe that's sometimes the way it's depicted to us, but the chances are that Mary, Joseph, and Jesus were just given a 
large sum of gold. Now, frankincense, uh, that's, a, that's like a gum-like substance that is extracted from a frankincense tree. It, it has a very desirable aroma, and it was the preferred fragrance of kings. Again, we see some significance there. They're giving a gift to the king. And again, it was expensive. It was imported from Arabia, usually. This is, it was very hard to fabricate. It was very hard to access in Israel. So it was a costly product. And then, of course, there's myrrh. And this is an ointment. And probably most of you have heard that this is used in the embalming process back then. Uh, but it was also used for expensive perfume. So myrrh and frankincense, they also have a lot of medicinal value as well. And uh, the, some people go a little bit far, I think, projecting onto the, the significance of these gifts to now infer that there are certain ailments that Mary and Joseph had. And I don't know, you can take this whole thing too far a little bit here. But myrrh it was used uh, for headaches. It helps with pain and swelling, skin health. It can fight off some bacteria and parasites. There's clearly some medicinal value with it. Uh, frankincense as well had a v- variety of uh, medicinal and cosmetic uh, qualities. In fact, it's very effective in treating inflammatory disease. So maybe these were necessary gifts for Jesus and Mary for health reasons, I think. I don't know. I actually think it's a little bit silly to jump into those kind of conclusions. So concerning the deeper meanings of what these gifts could mean, I think the overarching significance of these three gifts is that they are commensurate for a king. That's the, that's the big point. These are three gifts that if you were going to visit a king, this is what you'd bring. Gold, frankincense, myrrh. It, it's significant. It, it's, it's, it's rare. It's expensive. So I think that's probably the best place to camp out with their significance. Although if we do look back through Scripture, these items do seem to have some significance, uh, spiritual, some spiritual significance. There seems to be some value of it. Obviously, gold was used in the temple. It was used in the Ark of the Covenant. It was used for uh, you know, the utensils and, uh, in the palace. And so gold clearly, I think, is, has some significance in the Old Testament. Uh, But frankincense was one of the chief ingredients in holy anointing oil. It was used by the priests for incense. Now, incense in the Bible from the Jews was always offered to God, only God. It says in Exodus 30, verse 34, it is not for the people that it was for God. So I don't know, there's some significance there because the one thing that they offer to Jesus is the one thing that's used in the incense, which is only offered to God. And of course, Jesus is God. So I think this all plays into the potential significance of these gifts. Myrrh, because it's used in embalming the dead. Some speculate that that was like a prophetic foreshadowing of the death, burial, and resurrection, the sacrifice of Christ. Um, I'm not too sure about that, but either way, the men that appoint kings, the kingmakers, have arrived with gifts that are always given to kings. So the Magi, these three guys that you see on your Christmas card on camels with turbans, they're pretty significant to the Christmas story. It's, It's another layer of scriptural evidence or a, 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 to, to, to endorse the significance of who Jesus was, that he really was the Messiah. So much so that as, for all intents and purposes, pagan guys that believe in random stuff held on to the words of Daniel, found Jesus, and fell down and worshipped him and gave him the gifts that you would give to a king. So every time you see a card with three guys on three camels carrying three gifts, wearing flamboyant attire, uh, you'll be reminded that the highest earthly authority that appointed kings bowed down before Jesus. 
I invite the worship team up uh, as I share one last thought here. Uh, the Magi's journey, it speaks of how different everyone's search is to Jesus. These guys traveled 800 miles on a horse. If the average walking speed of a horse is three to four miles per hour, these guys were sitting in the saddle for three to four weeks to get there. They, they must have had some conviction here about this. Those words of Daniel must have just stuck in there. That star, whatever it was, they went after it. And their journey, their background, they weren't brought, brought up, raised in a Christian home. They took the long road to get there. You, know, you think about the, the shepherds. Their, their journey to Jesus was different, wasn't it? They were just up the road, maybe a, a day or two's travel. It was, they were Jews. They were waiting. And, and it was a little bit more ambiguous. They, they, the, the angel showed up and just spelled it out for them. Told them what had happened and where to go, what to look for. That was their journey. The Magi had a very different journey. You know, the, also what this reminds me of? To never underestimate the impact our words could have on somebody. Do you think Daniel knew when he was prefect over the Magi and he's kind of giving a briefing and he says, hey, listen, this is what the Lord has told me, that there is going to be one he's going to come. And he would have shared the prophecy of the 70 weeks. He would have shared Michael with them. And he would have shared God's word with them. And these magi are kind of thinking, okay, we're only listening to you because you're appointed over us and you interpreted that dream and we all didn't die. So we'll listen. But God's word held in their heart for hundreds and hundreds of years. And eventually they came to Christ. And it is a great reminder of the seeds that we plant and the words that we say and the truths that we state. So, so often when we, when we do share God's word with somebody or we do tell them about Christ, it's kind of unknown or unseen how it all plays out. You set this ripple effect and then we just trust that God's in it somehow. Maybe you have an unbelieving family member. Maybe they're an atheist. And you say things and you try to say things with some discretion and some wisdom and some kindness and some grace, and it's just hitting a wall with them, right? We probably all have one of those people in our family. You never know. You never know what's going to happen and how God's going to be working and how God's going to be uh, watering this. Remember, Paul says this. Uh, he says that, you know, I plant the seed, Apollos uh, waters the seed, but it's God that creates the growth. Hey, we all play a role in this somehow. I don't think Daniel had any idea that the words that he shared to the Magi would translate in them journeying 800 miles, standing before Christ and falling down and worshiping him. I don't think he had that sense. We all journey to Jesus in a very different way. Sometimes we take the long route. Sometimes it takes years. Sometimes it's like the shepherds, straightforward. And it's a great reminder of the role we play in how God draws people to himself. The Lord's words that he shared through Jeremiah remain true. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me. You will seek me with all your heart. Herod and the majority of Israel we're not in the search for Jesus. I don't know why. They were well versed on scriptures. They knew what happened. Were they more concerned about what the current king was going to do, that they were distracted by the king of kings? Is that why they didn't go? Did they fear? Were they troubled? Were they thinking, well, let's not go find Jesus because here it's going to lose his mind and I'll lose my head? Yeah, I'm not... So they laid low and they didn't pursue Jesus. I don't know. I don't know the reason why. 
uh, they were apathetic or agnostic about this. But as we reflect on the, the Christmas story, it all comes down to this. Jesus came to deliver mankind from sin. And we are either the Magi in the story or we are Israel. We either ignore it and get caught up with what's going on in this world, or we journey to Christ, we accept that He is King of Kings, and we worship Him. This only plays out two ways. We either accept or reject Jesus Christ. And it would be a shame to go through the Christmas season and not remember that that is the, the apex or the, the pinnacle of this whole thing. By all means, it's a joyful season. Yes, let's celebrate gifts, family, all that good stuff. The tradition is in there, of course, that's fine. But it matters that he was born because he is the king of kings and he is the answer to man's predicament of being bound up in sin. And it would be a shame if that passed any of us by, especially if you are not saved, if you're visiting and you haven't made that decision that the Magi make to worship Christ, then you are in a, you're in a bad spot because Jesus did arrive and he, his life plays out, he, his earthly ministry, and he eventually gives his life and has a victory over sin. You either come into that relationship with Christ or you reject Christ. And so that is the Christmas story. And I would encourage you, if you are that person that hasn't made a decision for Christ, or you don't know where you're at, then after service, we will have some prayer people up front. Casey will be up here as well. And I would encourage you, come up to the, the prayer team and say, yeah, I, I, I celebrate Christmas and I celebrate Jesus. Can you pray with me and point me in the right direction here? I'd really encourage you to do that. Let's pray. Father God, I just want to thank you uh, for the Christmas season. It is such a beautiful season just because of the joy and the community and family, time together. Uh, but we do direct our mind to you for a moment and recognize that you came for a purpose. That God, you sent your son and it is all because of what happened thousands of years ago in the Garden of Eden when sin entered this world and man could not stand before a holy God. And so, God, we are thankful for that. May we take joy in the hope of salvation that we have in you. That hope arrived. And so may, as we close in a worship song, may we sing to you, as a genuine extension of thankfulness and praise and honor, just like with the Magi I had when they stood before him. And we pray for this in your name, Jesus. Amen.